down, so let's get started. Um, I'll send out my first tweet. You can see I'm on Twitter. I have to say before I start that this conference has been amazing so far. Um, I wish Yamila was here because she needs as much recognition for the hard work that she and the other organizers have put into this conference. I've really been very impressed by how well organized it is, the quality of the talks, and I just think that you know, it's been really amazing. I'm, I'm really happy that I had an opportunity to come here this year and present in front of all of you guys. So let me, let me send out this tweet, and then I'll introduce myself and we'll start the talk. I will say the one problem is when you need the internet, it's always down, so this may not work. <laughs> um, so this is Embeddings of Python at PyCon ES 2013. Um, this talk is roughly about different things that you can, or, or it's about CPython, and it's about how CPython can interact with other programs, what CPython is, and just an overall view. But before I really get into the talk, I'll introduce myself. My name is James Powell. I run the New York City Python Meetup Group. It is the second largest Python Meetup Group in the world. It's probably the most active. You can see how many events we have, how many members we have. It's just an amazing group of, of people who come together every multiple times per week to learn about Python, to share you know, interesting things that they're working on, and just to form a community in the city for developers. It's something that I'm extremely proud of. And if any of you guys ever find yourself in New York City, please send me an email, and I'll, I'll, I'll invite you to one of these. I'll introduce you to everybody there. There's usually anywhere from 30 to 100 people there. And I promise you, if you can make the trip from Spain to New York, I will introduce you to every single person at that meetup, all 120 who show up on any given day. So this is Embeddings of Python. Uh, those are informa that's information about how to contact me. I'm on Twitter. I have an email address. For this talk, because it doesn't have slides, I wanted to go over a bunch of just very rough themes for the talk. So as I see it, this talk has, serves a purpose of kind of motivating looking at CPython source code for a greater understanding of Python and how Python as a system works, getting a more fundamental understanding of what really, what's the real core conceptualization of what is going on when you write a program in Python that's interpreted by CPython and how that interacts with other pieces of software. Um, personally, I view Python as something of a system within a system. Uh, a lot of the language seems to me that people have, have written large systems in C and C++ and Java for many years, and they realize a lot of common patterns occurring. And they wrote their own language in order to capture those patterns. And also, this talk is, I think, a little fun. Or at least I find it to be very fun. It's mostly about C and CPython. So there's actually only one piece of real Python code. So I'm going to show you a couple of small pieces of Python code that we'll visit a number of times through the talk. And then we'll start looking at our first embedding. So the first piece I'll show you is that we know that in the sys module, there's a, something called version info. And version info is this nice name tuple-like object that gives you the version. And so you can see that my IPython notebook is running 273. And you also know in the OS module, there's get PID, and that tells you the process ID. So my IPython is running in this process ID. We'll visit these very, much later on, but just keep those in mind. Every one of the examples I'll show you works off of some variant of a piece of code like this. And this is a very specific example I picked because this talk was created as a result of a bet gone wrong and also a presentation that I saw that made some claims that I didn't think were quite justified. The claims were that Python couldn't be compiled or it didn't mean anything to compile Python. And so I started to think, what does it really mean to have a compiled language versus an interpreted language? And how does Python fit in that spectrum? And the example that was used in that talk was this. You have a function that takes two types and two values. It constructs the values using the type constructor, and it multiplies them together. And the reason that this was picked is that you can see that there are very different behaviors based on what one of these arguments is. So you can see in the case that I do oops, string 10 and int 10. Oh, I need to define the function first. There we go. So you can see if I do int 10 and int 10 and I multiply them, I get 100. If I do string 10 and int 10, I get the repetition of that string 10 times. So we can see that 
there is some dynamic dispatch based on the type of the arguments. And this was the crux of the original argument for why you couldn't compile Python, that you'd never be able to capture that dynamic dispatch. And we're going to view this example actually more in this form. Because what I want to do is I want to write some, some code that takes four strings. And what it's going to do is it's going to get the first string and get the type corresponding to that string. It's going to take and then construct a value with the second string and then get a type and then another value and construct a value with that. So this is actually down here what the examples will probably look like for most of what I show you. And so you can see again with int 10 and int 10 I get 100 for string 10 and int 10 I get that string 10 repeated 10 times. And I'll show you just, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. I'll change that to that. And you can see I have to still define this guy. And then you can see repeated 10 times. So you can see with that same block of code, I'm getting very different behavior and very different code paths. The first thing I want to do, though, is something that we actually looked at on the Friday workshop. So you may have seen on Twitter, uh, B Code sponsored a really cool CPython workshop on Friday. And I think a couple of people who were there are also here today. I was a really fun time, and we looked at running Python under GDB in order to answer for ourselves some very interesting questions. I wish I had time to go over those questions because they're pretty wild. Like, why is hash of 1, 1, and hash of 2, 2, and hash of negative 2, negative 2, but hash of negative 1 is negative 2? And, and, and there were some other questions like that. But I wanted to cover just the very basics of that, which is this talk relies on having your own custom build of, or relies on having access to the source code of CPython and having it built and being able to inspect it with GDB. And that's actually a very easy process to do. So all you have to do is go to python.org. And if you scroll down, you'll see that they have these source tarballs. And you download the tarball and you build it. And the process for that is very easy. But if you're using Ubuntu, it's even easier. So in Ubuntu, you have this build dep under apt. And what this allows you to do is build all the dependencies in order to build a project. So if any of you have experience building software on Linux, one of the hardest things is you, build, you want to build this guy. And in order to build this guy, you have to build these guys. And in order to build these guys, you have to build these guys. Build depth solves that problem for you. Then you unzip, the, you, you untar the tarball. You pass configure. And I pass it with a couple of specific flags. Because with these flags, I get some very nice debugging information, additional debugging information from GDB. Then you make, and you make install. That last one should be make install. And I can actually run through these if you want. Although this first one I've already done, and this one you can see you configure, and then you can make. Um, and once you've done that, you end up with, this is like a, by the way, this is like a cooking show. Everything's been prepared. So I, I, I show you how to cook it, and then I, I pick the one out from the drawer that somebody cooked for me 30 minutes ago. So I'll say that. So here you go. Given that installation of Python, here is that installation of Python with GDB, running under GDB. And I can type run to run it. And I can see I have a Python shell. Now, there's something very interesting here because I can immediately answer some very interesting questions. Like, how do you actually get into Python? What does Python, the interpreter, look like? Because we know that Python runs under certain different circumstances. You can run a script. You do Python in the name of a script. Or you can run and it runs an interactive console for you. And so I want to show you a very simple version of that code. And one thing that you can immediately do in order to build some understanding for, of what CPython, uh, CPython works. So say I have just a very simple function. And instead of, instead of constructing the types, I'll just multiply them. And I'll use a very nice module called dis in order to produce bytecode for this. I have cards uh, promoting NYC Python that I'm happy to give to you guys. And on the back of them, I have six of my favorite imports. And one of them is from this import disk, because I think it's a really useful tool for understanding how Python works. And I'll interpret this for you very quickly. This is the line number, so the returns on the second line. These are the offsets of the bytecodes. These are the bytecodes. That's the argument, and that's some interpretation of the argument. So you can see in this case, I load two variables from my locals, x and y. I do this binary multiply op operation, and I return the value. This is how I got into Python and CPython. I try a little bit of code. I disassembled it, and I saw these bytecodes. And what I did was I grepped for the bytecodes in the source code. And when I did that, I ran into a file called ceval.c. And what ceval.c is the main part of the interpreter. It is, in fact, 
in Python 2, the interpreter loop. And you can see, if you look into this, you have an actual switch opcode. So what happens is there's a loop with all of your opcodes and a nice big switch statement, and it switches, and then for the case for that opcode, it processes the code for that. And in the case of this binary multiply, you can see, this is Python 2, by the way, you can see that when you do a binary multiply, it pulls two, two arguments off the top of the stack, and then it calls pi number multiply. Now I'm showing you this because I'm going to show you one very cool thing you can do right off the bat with a Python built that you can run under GDB and a little bit of knowledge of the source code that you can gain just from grepping. Notice this line number, 1261. I'm going to go back into GDB, and I'm going to put a breakpoint, a temporary breakpoint, at cval.c, 1261. And then I'm going to run, and you can see I've hit this breakpoint. So somewhere in the creation of my, my uh, interactive console, probably in some site library, I actually did a multiplication and it hit this bytecode. And what I can do with this is look at the backtrace. And the backtrace tells me all the frames that have hit before I got into this. And it actually starts to tell me something very interesting. Because if I look at the, if I look a little, this is actually pretty deep. Ooh, this is really deep. Um, but if you look, you can see some interesting things. Like here's your main entry point, main. It calls pi main. It calls pi initialize x. And as you go deeper and deeper, you'll start to see let me continue this. I want to, I want to actually break uh, one more place. So let me continue. And then I'll put that breakpoint one more time. And then I'll continue. And I'll just multiply two numbers. Oh. Um, so I'll put the breakpoint there. Continue. And then I'll call it. There we go. I've broken. So you can see I've broken on that binary multiply. And I'll show you the backtrace here. And you can see that all your Python code is evaluated in a, frame, in a function called C, pi eval, eval frame x. And you can see that, you can see the stage of the interpreter. And the one that I really want you to look at is this guy right here, pi run interactive one flags. So what happens is in the Python source code, there are these functions, pi run. And there's pi run functions that'll just run sing, simple strings of Python. If this were a module, it would end up calling probably pi run simple, fli, simple file. And you can see, oh sorry, pi run any file, x flags. And, there's a, and because it's C code, there's a lot of different versions of it in order to handle default arguments. But you can see something immediately. This is the structure of how deep you have to go before you can start interpreting Python code. And you can also see that the main interpreter is invoked by these pi run functions. We'll look at that very shortly. So first embedding we're going to look at is what's called the very high level embedding. And it's intimately related to what we just saw there. If you go to the Python documentation, they talk about a very high level embedding and a pure embedding. And when they mean a very high level embedding, they mean invoking this Python interpreter via just that pi run, those, that pi run argument. And you can see here, this is a script written in C that executes a Python program. And the Python program is described by this string here. You can see it's not very good C. You know, I have a lot of problems if, you know, I have a very, very poor check here to make sure I'm not exceeding the buffer length. You know, and if you put in arguments that are too long, I'll probably just fail instead of gracefully handling them. But I think it illustrates the point, which is I have a string of Python here, which I interpolate using some arguments from the command line. And then I run it in an interpreter that I initialize with pi initialize, I finalize with pi finalize, and I actually run the code with pi run simple string. That's a program text. I'll show you it to you in action. And you'll see, this is my file. And if I run it with no arguments, the thing just bails on me, because this is really bad C. I didn't put any error handling in it, so it just seg faults on me. But if I run it with the arguments I want, you can see it executes this string, multiplies it. So it executes printing of string of 10 and int of 10, which gives me 10, concatenated 10 times. And if I change the arguments to that, it gives me 10 times 10. And if you want to see, what kind of file it is, this should just be a elf executable. It's just a C program. And if you don't believe me, I'll even show you to you in Vim. You can see it's just a bunch of binary. This is in Python code. So what this illustrates is the very high level embedding is you have some big C or C++ application. And you want to run Python code somewhere. 
and you don't have a real need to interact with that Python code. You just need to launch it and get it running and you know, set it and forget it, fire and forget. What you can do is you can use this very high level embedding and just start up an interpreter, give it a string, it'll run that string to completion, and then you're done. And you can see I have no ability to interact with the output of this. This may be returning a value. This might be calling a function or returning a value. But I have no way to actually interact with that return value. I can't return it and then pass it back in. And you can see in this formulation, I initialized an interpreter. And I could put multiple Pyron statements, but I couldn't really capture values and then put them back in. There's some limitations. This is why it's very high level. I'm just embedding an interpreter right into, just smack dab in the middle of some C program. So you might think, what if I want to actually interact with that Python code? And that's the motivation for the pure level embedding. Going back to the previous example under GDP, we saw that for every one of these byte codes, there is some amount of C code backing it. So when you do a, we were looking at multiplication before, but if you do a divide, it does some operation on the stack, then it calls pi number divide. I want to show you that in the source code, and then that should motivate for you the very high level embedding. So here's binary multiply, just to keep it with the same example. And you can see it calls, there's binary multiply. And you can see that it calls pi number multiply. And pi number multiply, actually let me exuberant, I'll build tags for this so I can navigate easily. And I'll also clock up. Okay. Binary multiply. And it calls pi number multiply. And when I go into pi number multiply, you can see that if it's a sequence, it does sequence repeat. You can see that if it's a regular binary operation, it does some TP slot stuff at the top. And you can see that there's some C code backing this. One side point and a small tangent is that people like to talk about languages in, in reference to how far or close they are to the metal. And I think that one interesting consequence of understanding how Python works from this perspective is that you can see that for any one single line of Python code, you can deterministically generate lists of C code. So you could say that Python is not close to the metal in the sense that you don't have direct control over layout, you don't have control over uh, caches, you don't have control over alignment, but it's also close to the metal in the sense that any one line of Python code can deterministically be, be mapped to some line of C code, which could be deterministically mapped to some, some set of assembly code, although that may be very large assembly code because it has to include all of the dynamic dispatch. But back to the main point, you can see that for that one line of code that I wrote, I can, I can create, for that one line, that multiplication statement, I can, I can see what the underlying C source code lines are. And that's exactly what the pure embedding is. The pure embedding is what happens when you want to write out Python code. And instead of writing, instead of writing that code in terms of actual Python statements, like x times y, you write it in terms of the statements they map to, like pi number multiply. So here's a program, the exact same program, in slightly better C, written, written using the, very high, the pure embedding. And it's a very tedious exercise. So instead of creating a string directly, I have to do a pi string from string to turn this C string into a Python string. Instead of importing the built-in module, I have to do a pi import import. And you can see that, you can imagine what this would look like in regular code. This would be done for you automatically. This here would just be the simple statement of from built-in import something. Then you can see here the T represents type and the V represents value, so I'm doing a get adder. So this would just be built-in dot something or, or the actual get attribute call. And you can see I'm creating tuples for the values. So I need to do this in order to pass arguments. And I'm managing the memory myself. I'm doing a dec ref because I no longer need these two guys. In order to call the function, the actual type, so the str with an argument, I need to pass it a tuple. And that's why I do this pi tuple, and I have to set this item. So I'm doing all of these steps very manually. And I'm manually transliterating my Python code into C code. That's what the very high level embedding is. I'm sorry, the pure embedding. And even more tediously, I do the multiplication, and then I have to do some prints print statements to get you know, the actual value out. And then I have to do more memory management to handle all the things I don't need anymore. And then I pi finalize. That chunk in the middle is no longer just a, here's a string, run it. It's now an enumeration of all the actual C code that would run for that one piece of Python. And I'll show it to you in use. So here's a pure embedding. 
I wanted to show that this is slightly better C, because when I type it with no arguments, it actually gives me a little usage statement. And in use, it does the exact same thing as my other piece of code. So with string, it concatenates 10 times. With int, it just multiplies them together. The very high level embedding is, in this sense, a very tedious way to implement Python code. But it has the advantage that you can now interact with the interpreter itself. You can see that anywhere in the middle here, I could do some inspection of the return value. I could say, if the return value matches this, go on this branch of code. If it doesn't match, go on this branch of code. So the pure embedding has an advantage over the very high level embedding in that you now have the ability to run Python code within a C or C++ application with the ability to interact back and forth with it in order to inspect values, pass them around, determine what blocks of code to run. And you're now looking at something more of a hybridized mix of C and Python. Before I get into the last two embeddings, I want to talk about extension modules. So in Python, we have a quite a large amount of the standard library is written in Python itself. If you look at the source code for it, so we have the source code here. If we look at the source code for Python, which we have here, you can see that you have two folders that contain almost the entirety of the standard library, lib and modules. In the lib folder, you have all of the source code corresponding to all the libraries in the standard module that are actually written in Python. So if you ever have a question about how something in the standard library works, and you have an installation, say you're on a plane, so you don't have access to documentation, you can actually just go to this folder and figure out what the code is. I'll show you one other very interesting and very useful technique for doing this. Say you're on an airplane, and you're writing some code, and you have no access to outside documentation, no access to Stack Overflow, and the guy you're sitting next to has no idea what, what programming is. <laughs> and he's also, he's also almost in your seat because he's really big. Um, say, you want, say you're using name tuple, and you say, well, where's the source code for that? Well, what you can do is you can use the inspect module to both get the source code. So the inspect module contains a lot of really nice helpers that tell you things like, this is, the actual source, this is the actual source file for the source code backing this object in my currently running Python interpreter. And if I were too lazy to go to that location, or if it were a PYC file, I could just do this, and I can actually get the source code dynamically in the interpreter for that line of code. Very, very useful tool. And the other reasonably useful one is on the object collections, on collections itself, you can see that I have a underscore file underscore that also tells you the actual file that's backing it. So additionally, in addition to all that Python code, there's also this modules. And this modules contains parts of the standard library that are written in, Py in C itself. For performance reasons and for legacy reasons, there's actually quite a bit of C code in the standard library. And you should be able to recognize and understand why some of this is here. For example, there's a math module in here, there's iter tools, uh, you can see that there's a lot of POSIX-related stuff. There's a lot of modules here which bind to other C, uh, other C libraries. C pickles in here. Um, and you can see that just like you have a set of all the Python code, here's the actual set of standard library code written in C. I want to show you two examples of that in order to motivate the next embedding. So here is my second favorite module, written by Raymond Hedinger. This is iter tools. And in iter tools, we have things like chain, oops. So here's group by, but let me find iter tools dot chain. Yeah, here's chain. And you can see that what they've done is they've defined the whole, they've defined the whole struct for chain out here. And you can see these are all the different, met these are all the TP, the slot methods for it. And if you go to the bottom, you can see there's some boilerplate for instantiating these. And it's a fairly simple exercise to imagine that they, took, they may have taken pure Python code and translated it into C and then created a module around it with all of the attendant uh, boilerplate and structure. The other example I'd like to show you is math module. So for math module, if you go to the very bottom, you can see here are all your math functions. And you can see they've defined the methods for this module. 
with the documentation and some flags. And there's some initialization here as well that's fairly standard for them. And the last example I'll show you of an extension module is one that I wrote and spoke about yesterday in the generator's talk, which is one that I wrote in about 100, 111 lines of code. And you can see there's another commonality. I have the same init, the same structure. There's a lot of boilerplate. There's a format for it. But for the most part, it's just, real, it's just raw C code and some boilerplate, some format for binding it to or for making use of it in the Python interpreter. This tends to be actually fairly easy to write. And you can look at one of the examples in the standard library and figure out what you need to do. It's actually very easy to bind C code um, to some, to, you can bind a library, you can create Python bindings for a library um, in C. So I talked about transpiling or transliterating Python from Python to C. And I showed you that, for example, when you multiply two numbers together, that corresponds to a pi number multiply. When you add two numbers, that may correspond to a pi number add. There actually is a project out there that many of you have probably used that does this for you. And it's called Cython. So here I have a simple module with the function that I showed you in the very beginning. I have two types, two values. I construct, va I construct values under that type just using get adder to get it out of built-ins, and I print it out. And it's a very simple module. It has a simple main, and it does the exact same thing that all the other programs we've looked at. When I call Cython on it, it generates this. And you can see this is an enormous amount of automatically generated C code that essentially does something very similar to that pure embedding. It looks at each line of Python code. It determines what the corresponding line of C code would be. And it just writes it out to the file. Now, it does an enormous amount of bookkeeping for you as well. So you can see it's doing some determination on what version you're using. It's setting up globals. It's setting up some uh, other modules. It does a lot of work for you that may, that may be necessary in order to get your code to run or may just be, you, you may not actually need that much work done in order to run your code. And if you look into this far enough, you'll actually find a piece of code corresponding to the function that you wrote. So here you can begin to see this is information corresponding to the function that I wrote. So you can see I called it foo. Um, it took these arguments val1 and type1. You can even see it has the source code location hard coded in there as well. And when I run it, I can do import mod. So when I've run this Cython, when I've compiled this Cython code, I can do import mod. And you can see that it's no longer running from a Python file. It's now a shared object. So this is the Cython artifact that's been created, this mod.so. It's a Python code, transliterated C code, turned into a shared object linked against the shared object corresponding to the interpreter I'm running. And simply enough, I can just call mod.foo, and I get the same behavior that I saw. So the same code running, but now what's actually backing it is not Python code running the interpreter, but C code corresponding to the Python code that would have been running the interpreter. Well, this is actually a very interesting, this, this opens up a very interesting approach. The argument that was made is you can't compile Python code. So I wanted to see, could I run some Python code without an interpreter? And I thought, well, what you could do is you could take this Cython automatically generated code, and you can see that it has this static qualifier here. As we may know, in C, the static qualifier means that a function, well, the static qualifier in a function means that that function cannot be seen outside of that module. Well, if I were to remove the static qualifier so that I could now see these functions outside of the module, what I could do is write a pure C, C project that directly links against the shared object that I wrote. So no longer am I having a Python interpreter that's importing a module written in Cython. Now I have a C file, a C program, that's linking against the Cython generated code for me. And in this particular case, I still need to do the pi initialize and the pi finalize to start up and shut down my interpreter. But I only need to do that because I haven't taken the time or the effort to, to write these out. What you could think of is in this particular example, where I know the types that I'm dealing with, where I may know some things about the results. I may not even need the actual Python interpreter. I could automatically generate C code from my Python code using Cython remove static qualifiers so I could link directly against it. And then instead of having these lines here, I could initialize only the parts of the interpreter that I actually need. 
I don't need the garbage collector for this example, or I potentially may not need the garbage collector for this example. Because if I were multiplying two ints and I knew they were ints together, I wouldn't need the garbage collector. I could do that management directly in C. I, this pi string from string manages the garbage collector itself. But I don't need to do that because I know that the string object in Python is just a struct. And if I wanted to take the time, I could fill in those fields of the struct and allocate it directly with malloc. And I wouldn't, need the, I wouldn't actually need to use the Python garbage collector. I could create Python objects outside of the interpreter. The interpreter doesn't even know about directly by just mallocing them myself. This, I think, is a very interesting thought, thought example, or it's a thought experiment, which is what you could potentially do is create a zeroth level or a medium level embedding, wherein you take Python code, you transliterate to C, and you do all of the bookkeeping yourself in order to strip out parts of the interpreter that you don't need. Now, the reason that I don't have a more fleshed out example of this is because it would be incredibly tedious to do. But what you could think of is that you might actually be able to run, a, you'd be able to run Python code without an interpreter because the correspondence between that Python code and what the interpreter does is so clear and so direct. And you can see in this example, all I'm doing is I'm actually running this line right here, which is a C function corresponding to the Python function that I wrote. But I'm not running Python code when I call foo. I'm running C code that was generated from Python code. So that, that, was the, that was the talk that I saw that I disagreed with, that you can't compile Python. I wanted to show an example for it. And the bet that came up was one that was related to a friend of mine. So I have a friend who is a huge Python 3 aficionado. He thinks that we should be using Python 3 for everything. As a consequence, when I made the business cards uh, with my favorite imports on the back, I included one import to please him, which was from Functools import reduce. Because as we know, reduce was moved out of built-ins and put into Functools in Python 3. And I sent that to him specifically because I said, look, my cards are written in Python 3. And he really liked it. Well, as part of our discussion back and forth, you know, there's a reality as to if you have a library that's only in Python 2, you can't... You can't use Python 3 because you need that library and you'll have to wait for that to be ported. Similarly, if you're in Python 3 and, or if you're in Python 2 and you want to use the latest and greatest and it was written for Python 3, you're kind of stuck because you might, you might need Python 2 or you might be more familiar with it or maybe you're, you're on App Engine and you don't have access to Python 3 and you're excluded from the use of some other libraries. So I thought, well, why can't you run them together? You know, in the US, people have really taken to Nutella, and it's two great tastes mixed together. So could you run Python 2 and Python 3 simultaneously? And this is where we get to what I like to call, I call this by different names, but um, I've called it Py 2 so 3 or Python 5. But the thought is, this Py run simple string, right? Why can't you take this Py run simple string and put it into a Python module, an extension module? Because an extension module is just, you know, as we see, an extension module is just C code that can call any other C code. And as we saw from the very high level embedding, you can just run a function that calls an interpreter. So why can't I write an extension that runs a function corresponding to the Python 3 interpreter and import that into a Python 2 interpreter? Well, the problem is that the Python 3 project and the Python 2 project actually share quite a bit of code. And it, more explicitly, when you build these two shared objects, they, the linker is not able to determine which, which pi, pi run simple string you mean because in Python 2 it's called pi run simple string, in Python 3 it's called pi run simple string, and C, lacking any, any sort of namespaces, has no way to disambiguate which one you want. So when you actually try this the first time, you run into a swath of linker errors. The linker can't determine whether this piece of code here is run it in the Python 2 interpreter or the Python 3 interpreter, and it'll bail on you. However, it turns out that the tool chain for C is actually very, very rich. And people have been facing these problems for a very long time. There are tools called NM and tools called object dump, and they tell you, given a shared object in Python, here are all the exported names. Here are all the names that the linker has to know about. And what you can do is you can take that and you can write a source filter. So you can, in Python or in Perl or you know, even in Shell, you can write a source filter that says, given this shared object, find all the exported names, take those exported names, go into the Python 3 source code, and just change their names by prefixing them. Python, Py, uh, sorry, C doesn't have namespaces. And what people use instead is a form of nominal namespacing where you say, 
the name of the project underscore whatever. So just take all of the exported symbols, call them pi3 underscore pi run simple string, and try and build it. Well, when you do that, you'll run into some problems because in the Python project, there's some automatically generated code. There's some use of uh, macros in order to generate the exception class hierarchy. So you have to do a little bit of additional manual work. But once you've done that, you have a fork of Python 3 where all the exported names are, have different, all the exported symbols have different names. So it's source compatible, but, or rather the, it, it, the source code that can run in Python, in the regular Python 3 can run in your modified one. The only thing that's changed is what's happening at the C layer. And it's something which you can now link against a Python 2 library. So what you end up with is something that looks like this. You can see I've done, I now have to disambiguate between Python 2 and Python 3. So now for my includes, I have to know if I'm including the Python 3 pi debug or the Python 2 pi, or the Python 3 python.h or the Python 2 python.h. You can see there's this no site flag that's usually called pi no site flag, but now I call it pi 3 no site flag. And through this automated process, I end up with an extension module that has a single function on it called eval that does the very high level embedding directly from an extension module. And so if you remember at the very beginning of the talk, I asked you guys to just keep in mind two things, get version info and OS. So here I have a Python interpreter. So let's take a look at what, what version info says. So it's running 2.7.5 and it's running in this process. Let me, in my embedded, in my embedded interpreter, import the same things. And since this is, you can, you can see that there's one, you can guess what's going to happen because I put this here. So you can see I have Python 3.3 running in the exact same process space as Python 2.7. They're not, I'm not shelling out and running in a separate interpreter. I'm not doing some trick where I'm having some code executed over here and some code executed over here. I have both interpreters running within the same process with access to the same virtual memory simultaneously in Py2SO3. So I thought this was a very interesting, this is, somebody told me I couldn't do it. And I said, <laughs> don't tell me what I can't do. <laughs> so I came up with this, but it's actually very interesting. Um, and this is a project that I've, I've, I've been talking about this for a while, a couple months. Um, and there are a lot of issues with this to actually see if you can ever make it useful. And I'm really desperately now looking for people who can help, out, help flesh this out a little bit more. You can see what I did in this extension module is use the very high level embedding. Ideally, what we'd use is the pure embedding so that we'd be able to interact directly with the results from the Python 3 interpreter. Additionally, we'd want to make this a uh, less manual process, more automated process. So there are a couple of issues with this approach. The first one is, in order for me to interact, I can interact across the interpreter boundary, but in order for me to do that, I need to write shims. And just like if you've ever looked at, there's a project called, um, that, that embeds Lua in Python, and there's one that embeds Python and Lua. All they do is they write shims so that if you, make, if you touch this method in Python, it corresponds to doing this in Lua, and if you do this in Lua, it corresponds to this in Python. It's a fairly simple thing to do, but it requires a little bit of effort. So then, once you have the shims written, you can run your Python 3 code and then interact with it from Python 2 and vice versa. But once you create the shims, you run into a couple of small problems. Garbage collection. So each interpreter has its own garbage collector, and they'll be able to resolve circular references in their own garbage collectors. But if you were to get a reference in Python 2 and a reference in Python 3 and it was circular, the two garbage collectors have no concept that the other one's running. So what you'd need is some way to resolve circular references between the two interpreters. You may need some hybridized garbage collector or just some simple additional collection step that says, make sure that there's not a circular reference between these two, these two um, sets of managed memory. And then there are some problems with the GIL as well, because if you have multiple threads running, you want to make sure that you're not touching a Python 3 object when you don't hold the GIL or touching a Python 2 object when you don't hold GIL. So you may need to write these shims in such a way that they very pessimistically lock the use of the interpreter. And then finally, there's a couple of problems with recompilation. So I used a very, very primitive approach at source filtering. I think that there are more sophisticated approaches but require a, a quite a bit of research and some effort put into them. 
both GCC and Clang have some source filtering mechanism. They have plugin mechanisms. And I think the ideal would be that you write a plugin that, that allows you to do this renaming automatically. Then you'll have access, then you'll be able to, um, you, you'll avoid one of the limitations of this project, which is in my embedded Python 3 interpreter, if I'm using, if I try to use a module that needs to be compiled, I need to run the source filter on that module and then recompile it. Potentially with a plugin or a source filter, a proper source filter, I can avoid that step and I'll only need to do the recompilation. I won't need to do the same tedious um, rewriting. So I think it's a very interesting project. If you were to ask me whether it's useful or not, I would say yes because I won the bet. But, <laughs> but in terms of what you could do with it, there are some interesting prospects. You might be able to have a large system that's all in Python 2 and run a little bit of Python 3 code in a limited state case where maybe that library doesn't exist in Python 2 or vice versa. You could run unported libraries from Python 2 in your Python 3 system or if you had versioning conflicts, you could run a Python 3.3 within a Python 3.4. What, what I've been trying to find the time and the effort to put into, and I wish I could present for you today, is a Python 1 running in a Python 2 running in a Python 3. <laughs> but but you, the actual effort in order to build these embeddings is very tedious and, very di and, and a little bit more difficult than I want it to be. So if any of you guys have an interest in this, or an inclination towards C or C Python, please come up to me afterwards. And maybe we can turn this into an actual project on GitHub as opposed to just something crazy that I show people when I'm you know, drunk in the bar at 2 AM. <laughs> uh, so this is embeddings of Python. I hope that this motivated the topics that I was interested in. Namely, you can see that Python is kind of a system within a system. There's another layer of things. There's another system there where the objects have particular interactions. and that. You know, a lot of the times when we write these large systems, we, we write them in C, or, or, or to put it another way, the Python interpreter is itself a large C system. And Python code that you're writing on top of that is a system within that system. And what I didn't get into much in this talk was that, personally, I think that writing too much of a layer on top of the interpreter itself is a waste. Because when, the deeper you look into the interpreter, the more you see that a lot of common problems have been solved for you. However, I think that we had some fun, and I think that we saw a little bit about how Python works internally, or C Python works internally, a little bit about how you can embed it more practically using extension modules, using Cython, the very high level embedding, and the pure embedding. And we also looked at two fun little things. So I'll take you to my last side. This is my, my standard joke, fin de la cita, <laughs> because I figure you know, if, he can, if he can make that mistake, then we're all human. I'm James Powell, I'm at Twitter here, this is my email address. I hope you enjoyed this talk. <laughs> Any questions? I'm actually wondering what did you win for winning the bet? <laughs> I, so, so I like to say that I won the adulation of my peers, but then I just became known as, oh, he's the guy over there who did this. So. I actually, I actually have gotten a very bad, uh, imp you know, my blog is don't use this code. That's because that's a reputation I've developed. <laughs> Please. Uh, yes, uh, I'm aware of a very obscure project which is called BCC Pi. I don't know if you know that. No, I don't. What does it do? Uh, it's a guy on Northern Ireland, uh, Philip Heron, that is developing a front end for Python for, for BCC. So he actually has a working uh, like front end for BCC to compile Python. So, we, so just, just so they get on video, there's a project called GCC Pi yes. uh, run by a gentleman in Northern Ireland yes. that is a front end for GCC, front end for, for GCC compiling, for, compiling Python. for compiling Python. Yes, like he has been working on his own. Like uh, he, he did a talk on, on Python Ireland this year, and I found it very interesting because he has been working on his own for four years trying to get this mm -hmm. work. He has now like a sort of um, proof of concept kind of thing. So, you know, it's working, but uh, not, he's not trying to do everything fancy. He's taking like important classes and everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very interesting, you know, mix of it. Because it basically, like, you can't do that. Yeah, you guys have made that. Oh, yeah, so that's definitely something we should, we should all look into. Thank you very much. Yeah. So anyway, I will, I will send you uh, a reference so you can take Absolutely, it. that would be fantastic. Any other questions? Oh, in the back. Um, I was wondering, 
can get the, the Python tree to interact with the libraries maybe you import in the Python tree? So, so what I can do in the, in the limit example that I have is in the Python 3 interpreter, I can import any Python 3 library that I have already built using the, they've already source filtered. Um, I can inter I can do everything that I want in Python 3. So you can see in this guy here, you know, I could do, and then I can, you know, I can, in uh, there's some state here. I can actually interact back and forth. The one thing that I don't have is interaction across the interpreter boundary. Uh, although you can see just like the transition from the very high level to the pure level, pure level embedding, it just, requ uh, uh, it just requires somebody to go in and spell things out. No, uh, any other questions? But I love random ideas, by the way. Okay. So did you consider like creating an auxiliary library that links with Python 3 and then exporting <coughs> all the Python API, basically rename, and then on your extension module, which is compiled for Python 2, you DL open your auxiliary library and you have access to all the symbols? That, that may, that's actually a very interesting thought. We'd have to look at that in greater depth. I think that... Just on the top of my head, I think the limitation of creating an auxiliary library and using DL open in order to get the symbols, maybe that it may be, because the, the symbols are kind of sprawled all over the place, it may be a little bit difficult, difficult to do it. But that, I think it would be a, a worthwhile approach to look into. But definitely, so we already have two people who I need to talk to, so you shouldn't leave this room to the next talk until I've spoken to you yet. Have I not done enough for you today? <laughs> um, it, that would be very interesting to try. Um, I can't really comment too much on it, but it would be a very interesting, very interesting project. Okay, I think that we're all done here. Thank you very much.